welcome back in this module we will look into some of the system components in a little more detail we have four broad classifications of the components they are civil and hydraulics mechanical electrical and social civil and hydraulics we have headworks which includes the diversion bear intake gravel trap spillway and a settling basin headrest is a canal or a pipe that conveys the water from the headworks to the four bay structure four bay tank is a tank at the entrance to the penstock pipe this tank allows for flow transition from a open channel to pressure flow penstock is a pipe that conveys water under pressure from the four bay to the turbine inlet powerhouse is a building that accommodates and protects the electromechanical equipment such as the turbine generator and other end use machines tail race is a channel or a pipe that conveys water from the turbine after the power generation back into the stream mechanical components comprise of the prime mover in our case this is a turbine which converts kinetic energy into mechanical energy this mechanical energy has to be transmitted to another equipment which is done through a drive train gears belts and couplings are typically used to transmit mechanical power flow control components like sluice gates gate valves are also mechanical in nature these are mostly housed inside the powerhouse the final classification is the electrical the main component in the electrical section is the generator which converts the mechanical energy into electrical energy a load controller keeps the power output quality stable by keeping the turbine always on full load protective equipment like lightning arresters surge arresters and proper earthing are very important for the safety of the equipment and operators switch gear includes switching contactors distribution bus bars and so on transmission is usually a low voltage line it can be overhead or underground now please click on the link in the chat window and answer the questions prime mover is a primary source of power all machinery that provides power for performing different kinds of work are prime movers so a diesel engine is a prime mover pelton turbine is a prime mover whereas 
the belt and couplings transfer this power in between the machines so they are not prime movers they are just equipment to transfer the power alternator and rice huller or end use machines where the prime power is converted into electricity or mechanical power is used to de-husk paddy so they are also not prime movers This picture shows a typical layout for a microhydro scheme. The water is diverted at the intake weir. This water carries a lot of silt. This silt is removed in desilting tank. It is also known as settling basin. From the desilting tank the water goes on to another tank called four bay tank this four bay tank has some interesting features which we will talk in detail later from the four bay tank the water enters into a pipe which is called as penstock up to the four bay the water is exposed to the atmosphere and after the four bay it is in a pressurized condition penstock delivers the water into the turbine generating electricity or mechanical power and then it leaves the turbine and goes through a canal called tail race which leads it back to the stream this is another layout which is also possible the main difference here is it has a very short penstock and a long canal typically for a low head project this is how the layout looks let us look into the head works the starting structures of a scheme or collectively called the headworks in micro hydro schemes the headworks include the diversion weir intake and gravel trap a spillway and a desilting basin are also usually at the headworks a diversion weir is a low structure kind of a small dam built across the stream which diverts some of the flow into the hydro power scheme the weir can be permanent semi permanent or temporary nature the next is intake intake is slightly at the upstream from the diversion weir where water is diverted into a canal or a pipe usually a flow control structure like sluice gate and a coarse trash rack or incorporated at the intake in fast flowing mountain streams 50 to 100 meter upstream of the diversion weir another small temporary dam is built to reduce the sediment load coming on to the diversion weir spillway is an opening in headrace canals that divert excess flow and only allow the design flow downstream desilting tank or settling tank is where sand and other finely suspended particles present in the stream water are settled and then removed if allowed to enter the penstock such particles will damage the penstock pipe and the turbine The picture shows temporary but very effective diversion structure. This stream is in Himalayan state of Uttarakhand. The water is diverted using the natural features. A huge rock in the middle of the stream acts like a diversion structure and some stones are loosely placed as a canal wall. 
You can also see a spillway where excess water goes out and joins back the stream. The beauty of such temporary diversion structures, especially in wild mountain streams, is that even if it gets damaged by a flash flood, which happens almost every year, it is very easy to put these things back in place. Imagine if you have built these things with concrete and if the concrete is damaged, it takes a lot of effort and lot of money to repair the concrete dam. Whereas a simple structure of stone dam like this one can be easily repaired quickly using the local labor and local skills. This is the diversion structure kind of semi-permanent which is built on a huge river. The river is about 100 meter wide and we are not taking all that water. We want only 1 50th of this water. Building a small structure like this one on the sides of it and then take only that much water which is required for our power generation. This structure is semi-permanent in nature and also comparatively easy to repair and put it back in place even when it gets washed away in floods. This is a typical diversion structure one comes across in many of the mountain streams where these small concrete dams are built to help divert water for irrigation and for catchment improvement in many states in India. So, if you are lucky to have such a dam in place, this can be easily adopted as an input structure for a micro hydro also. These structures are permanent in nature. Let us look into the details of how an intake works. There are two kinds of intakes. One is called a side intake and the other one is called bottom intake or drop intake. The side intake has a diverting channel and a gravel trap or spill gate to return the bed load to the river. The drop intake has a trench that is built perpendicularly to the stream flow direction. The trench is covered with a trash rack to avoid debris from falling into the trench. Side intakes are simple and less expensive than other types of intake. They are easy to build, operate and maintain. Side intakes are very similar to the traditional intakes for irrigation and hence the local people can quickly learn the principles of operation and maintenance of these intakes. The side intake looks like this picture where the water enters at 90 degrees to its flow direction into the canal. You can also see that at the entry point itself you have a desilting structure and a spillway after which the intake is placed and then from there the water enters into the power canal also called as headrace canal. This is the plan view from the top. As you can see, the water enters into the intake work through a trash rack and then it goes through a gravel trap which removes all the small stones rolling down along the water and then it enters into the headrace canal. You can also see a flushing gate which is used to clear up the gravel once it is collected periodically. The self-cleaning action of the water pushes out the gravel back to the river. Then water enters into the canal which is the power canal and you can see there is a spillway opening across it. The spillway takes the excess water back to the stream. The key feature of a side intake is that it is always placed at right angle to the flow direction that is 90 degrees to the flow direction. 
side intakes should have a properly sized spillway which can safely divert the excess water which can come during flash floods so that water should not enter into the power canal if the stream bed is rocky then there will be a lot of small loose stones which will roll down so it is an absolute necessity to have a gravel trap which will make the stones to settle down if it is not done these stones may enter into the turbine and damage the turbine drop in takes work very well in steep slopes on gentle slopes it is better to use side intake in the drop intake the entire weir is submerged the excess flow just flows over the drop intake you don't need a separate spillway to control this that is a major advantage of a drop intake a properly designed drop intake takes only the design flow and the excess flow just passes over the drop intake it can be built at the same level of the stream you have to just dig a trench across the stream this drawing shows the drop intake in detail a fast flowing stream usually brings in a lot of debris this type of intake forces the debris to pass over by the action of the water itself you can see from the drawing the debris cannot enter into the trench because of the trash rack it just gets pushed over by the water it is important to use properly sized trash rack and correctly designed slope for the self cleaning action to happen so this is an important point in drop intake siting the intake is a very crucial factor in the drawing shown where will you site it if you build the intake at the inner curve between aa and bb you can see all the debris getting collected over there will enter into the intake same situation at the cc point so it is better to place the intake at the outer part of the curving section in a stream now time for a question break as usual please click on the link in the chat window and answer the questions let us look at the answers allowing the excess flood water to flow over the four bay tank is not safe it will damage the power house and other civil works along the way the second option is the right one the proper correct way is to divert this excess water through spillways the last option is also wrong to a major extent the excess flood water can be prevented from entering the intake but cannot be stopped completely some excess water during floods will still enter so the right answer is it has to pass through the spillway the second question the drop intake is more complicated so it is very difficult to build and thus it is more expensive 
it is not cheaper so that's the wrong answer but the design is self cleaning it's a correct answer debris get washed over the intake without any external work by the very design of the intake the debris cannot enter into the trench it gets pushed over by the flowing water so it is self cleaning that is a major advantage of drop intakes spillways or openings in headrace canals that divert excess flow and only allow the design flow downstream the primary function of a spillway is to safely dispose the excess flow which happens during floods sometimes when the turbine is stopped design flow will be diverted through the spillway it can also be used as a flushing device for the gravel or desilting tank it is also important to place the spillway in such a way that the excess flow does not affect the cultivated land of the village nearby the water from the stream carries small particles of solid matter the silt load is composed of hard abrasive material such as sand and will cause extensive damage and rapid wear to the turbine runners to remove this silt the water flow must be slowed in the settling basin so that the particles settle on the tank's floor where the deposits can be periodically flushed out what happens when the silt enters the turbine if a desilting tank is not included or not designed properly this is what happens to the turbine canal can be a low cost method of conveying water from a source to a more favorable intake position for some sites this can really improve the economic viability by reducing the length of penstock and cable required but at some other sites canal is an expensive addition and can often require regular maintenance due to leaks soil erosion and landslides the canal should be able to pass the design flow rate whenever possible the canal should be constructed as an earthen canal dug out of the river bank to save cost it may be necessary to strengthen weak areas with masonry or concrete for example on steep or unstable slopes for the same design flow canal made from concrete can allow a faster flow so can have smaller dimensions the channel should have a shallow gradient otherwise the fast flowing water will erode the channel and fill the four bay tank with stones a fall of 1 meter in 100 meter should be sufficient for an earth channel and gradients greater than 2 meter in 100 meter should be avoided typical layout of a canal route is shown this is a very interesting diagram it not only shows about the channel but also some other components we can see just before the intake you have extended walls called wing walls that protect the river banks during flood waters the water enters the intake and immediately downstream a flood spillway is there then it goes to a silt basin where the silt is removed and that flush out of the silt basin is also connected back to the stream then there may be some places where there are small ditches along the way of the canal 
where you have to have a structure to cross those ditches or there could be footpaths where people have to walk over the channels so you may have to build small foot bridges the canal takes the water all the way to the four bay tank the four bay tank also has a spillway and in some places the four bay tank also acts as a settling basin four bay is a tank at the entrance to the penstock pipe the four bay tank allows for flow transition from open channel to a pressure flow it maintains submergence depth for the penstock pipe to avoid vortex formation and provides storage when there are low fluctuations in the turbine it can also serve as a final settling basin in fact sometimes the settling basin and the four bay structures are combined together fixing the penstock properly is important if a penstock is fixed like as it is shown in this figure there is going to be a lot of turbulence at the entrance which is not good which will increase the losses so a component called a bell mouth is used at the entrance of the penstock this will reduce the loss by streamlining the entry properly streamlining avoids the vortices which are very dangerous in that they can erode the four bay structure there are some important factors to consider when designing the four bay main factor is the volume how much water should be there in the four bay as a thumb rule it should have at least 15 seconds of design flow if the flow rate is q the volume of the four bay should be at least 15 q the second factor is called surge when the turbine is stopped suddenly a lot of pressure will travel back to the four bay tank causing the water level in the four bay to raise very quickly if this is not handled properly it will spill over the penstock and it will damage the structure so the four bay should be designed to handle such surge rises the four bay should also have mechanism to desilt and flush out the silt periodically the next important factor is the inclusion of an air vent pipe this is a very important component on which we will be talking about in the penstock design the penstock position is also a very important factor it should be submerged by water at least by 4 diameters of the penstock if the penstock is of say 30 cm diameter 4 times that is 120 cm of water should be above the penstock which of the following designs is of correct type a or b both are wrong design a will have a high entry loss as penstock is projecting inside in the design b four bay is at 90 degrees to the canal flow this will produce vortices as you can see in the picture this slide shows a simple and effective four bay design it has a trash rack which stops small stones and other debris getting into the penstock there are two simple valves one to open up the flushing the other one is to divert the water to the canal downstream to stop the turbine now 
quiz time again. Please click on the link. Answer to the question 1. Velocity is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area. Smaller the area, higher the velocity. To make the sediments to settle down, we have to slow down the water. This can be done only by increasing the area. So, expanding the area and decreasing the velocity is the right answer. The answer to the second question, in order of high resistance to low resistance, earthen canal, wooden canal, concrete, metal and lined concrete. Lined concrete offers least resistance. Lined concrete is nothing but plastered smoothly inside. Surge happens when high back pressure occurs. This happens only when the turbine is suddenly stopped or blocked. Penstock entry block will also make water overflow, but this will happen very slowly and this is not surge. Answer to the fourth question, the trash rack stops the stones and other debris getting into the penstock. Desilting tank can remove only sediments. Filter on the canal will not stop small stones. A penstock is a closed conduit for supplying water under pressure to a turbine. The penstock is fixed at its upper end to a fobe tank and at the lower end it is connected to the turbine. The penstock alignment should start where the ground profile gets steeper. An ideal ground slope would be between 1 is to 1 and 1 is to 2. The first number is the vertical distance, the second number is the horizontal distance. The flatter the ground slope, the less economic is the penstock. It is difficult to manually lay penstock, construct support piers, and anchor blocks if the slope is greater than 1 is to 1. That is, if it is 1 is to 0.5, that means it is very, very steep. You cannot build anything there. Also, try to minimize bends since these will require additional anchor blocks. The penstock pipe usually constitutes a significant portion of the total microhydro construction cost. Therefore, it is worthwhile optimizing the design. This involves a careful choice of pipe material such as mild steel or HDPE. An economic diameter such that the head loss is within acceptable limits and wall thickness so the pipe is safe for the design head and any surge effect that may result from sudden blockage of the flow. Since the flow is conveyed under pressure, it is important for the pipe design to be safe. Anchor blocks and support blocks help to distribute the forces safely. Can we use concrete for penstock material? For very, very low heads and very short lengths, one can try concrete, but as you may all know, concrete does not have tensile strength. It has only compressive 
uh, strength. Whereas in a pen stock, it goes through tensile pressures. So the concrete may crack. Anchor block is an encasement of a pen stock designed to restrain the pipe movement in all directions. Anchor blocks should be placed at all sharp, horizontal and vertical bends. Since there are forces at such bends which will tend to move the pipe out of alignment. Anchor block should normally be constructed of 1 is to 3 is to 6 concrete. That is 1 part cement, 3 parts sand, 6 parts aggregate with 40% plumps and nominal reinforcement. Plumps are boulders that are distributed evenly around the block such that they occupy about 40% of the block volume. The boulders add weight to the block and therefore increase stability while decreasing the volume of cement required. Downstream of every anchor block, one expansion joint should be placed to allow for lateral movement of pipe due to thermal expansion. See the black ring here, that is an expansion joint. Anchor block should be placed at vertical or horizontal bends of the penstock. A filled penstock exerts forces at such bends and the pipe needs to be properly anchored. Immediately upstream of the powerhouse, one anchor block should be there. This minimizes force on the turbine housing. At sections of the penstock where the straight pipe length exceeds 30 meter, an anchor block should be there. This is to limit the thermal expansion of the pipe since an expansion joint will be placed downstream of the anchor block. Slide blocks or also called support blocks should be provided for each length. The reason is to safely carry the weight of water and the pipe. Slide blocks prevent the upward and sideways movement but allow a small lateral movement. If the penstock is buried underground, obviously there is no need for slide blocks. Slide blocks are generally constructed out of stone masonry in 1 is to 4 cement mortar. A 140 degree bearing area from the center of the penstock diameter should be provided to support the penstock pipe. The powerhouse houses the electromechanical equipment such as the turbine, generator and control panels. The main function of this building is to protect the electromechanical equipment from adverse weather as well as possible mishandling by unauthorized persons. Cost can be brought down if the construction is similar to other houses in the community. The powerhouse should have adequate space such that all the equipment can fit in and be accessed without difficulty. The powerhouse should have proper ventilation and all the machines, especially the rotating parts, should have protection around them to prevent accidents. And a bypass valve which can enable quick shutdown of the turbine without putting pressure on the penstock. So these are all the factors to consider when designing a powerhouse. The tail race is a channel or a pipe that conveys water from the turbine after the power generation back into the stream. A tail race should not allow backflow, should be properly protected against washouts, landslides, etc. by building riprap walls or concrete aprons. Finally, after the power is produced, it has to reach the community. 
transmission lines connect the load centers to the powerhouse. Should be very carefully planned to keep it at minimal cost and maximum safety. Overhead, underground, single phase, three phase, grid connected, standalone. There are various options like these exist. Each one should be analyzed and an optimum solution should be selected based on the site requirement. Now, let us practice some simple calculations. Using the formula, find out the power potential for each site. The answers are here now. You can check with your answers. I hope all of you got this correct. If you look at this closely, the Nagaland and Manipur sites have the same head but different flow rate and thus different power outputs. Now compare the first site, the Meghalaya site, with the last site, the Manipur site. Both have almost the same power output, which will be more viable economically. Yes, higher the head, lower the cost per kilowatt, as the quantity of water to be handled becomes less. Let us freshen up a bit by trying to answer some questions. Please click on the link and answer the questions. The answers are, the answer for the first question, the best configuration is to keep at 90 degrees. So the option 3 is the right answer. The answer 2, anchor block has to support the pipe against sliding, has to stop the pipe from moving and it has to counter the forces at the bends. So option 4 which is all of the above is the correct answer. Answer 3. Trash rack stops only debris and small stones, sticks, etc. but not the silt. Spillway has a different function. It is used for flood water discharge, not for desilting. Penstock? No way. Desilting tank is where the silt is removed. So option 4 is the right answer. The last one, tail raise. Tail raise just takes the water back to the stream. No rule in silt removal. The fourth answer is option 4 is the correct answer as the spillway has to dispose flood water, prevent overflowing, divert access, divert excess flow safely from canal, all of that. 
And the last answer is the expansion joint should be placed downstream of every anchor block to allow pipes thermal expansion. Thank you all. We will meet again shortly.